Looking for a life that's filled with meaning and purpose? Then stay tuned to WOTJ Moorhead City and FBNRadio.com. Making known to this nation the gospel of Jesus Christ. Stay tuned for today's message that was preached and recorded by the founder of the Gospel Hour, Evangelist Dr. Oliver B. Green. Yesterday, I started a new series of messages on the Gospel Hour. I'll be speaking daily, Monday through Friday, on the subject... Bible prophecy. Now, as I said yesterday, and I won't say this anymore, I do not know how many days, weeks, or months we will study Bible prophecy. We are beginning at the beginning, and we're going to study as the Holy Spirit directs. Lead us, kind, gracious, heavenly Father, because if Thou dost not lead us, then our preaching is vain, empty. But, We thank Thee, our Father, that we have the promise that the unction, the Holy Ghost, will teach us, and we need not that man teach us. We thank Thee that the Holy Ghost dictated the Word of God to holy men. They penned it down. And we thank Thee that He is the teacher of Thy Word. And as we study today, bless the dear people in the Gospel Hour congregation who are hungry and thirsty for righteousness, hungry and thirsty for the things of God. O Lord, enlighten my mind and speak to my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Here is the passage that we're using, and I won't read this every day because it takes too much time, but I am reading it again today. Here is the passage that we're using as a basis or a foundation for the beginning of our discussion of prophetic truth. In Isaiah chapter 46 and verse 9 through 13. Isaiah 46 verse 9 through 13. Remember the former things of old, for I am God. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executed my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it. I also, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. Listen to me, ye stout-hearted, that are far from righteousness. I bring near my righteousness. It shall not be far off, and my salvation shall not tarry. And I will place salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory, for Israel, my glory. Underline that. Now then, I also read yesterday, but I did not finish discussing uh, the, the statements that I wanted to discuss in this passage. I read Isaiah chapter 41. And here is a very interesting challenge from Almighty God. Here is a challenge from Almighty God. This is Isaiah 41, 21. Produce your call saith Jehovah bring forth your strong reasons saith the king of Jacob you know I mean this sincerely I wish I could settle down and teach just talk and read I wish I could just I wish I could type out these sermons and read them to you on the radio I mean that but that's just not me I've been doing this just like I'm doing it now for 36 years, 
And it's just impossible for me to do it any other way. I'll do it this way till I die. I, I wish I could just read. Now listen. Produce your call, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reasons, saith the king of Jacob. Let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter end of them, or declare us things for to come. Now, he is saying to the stout-hearted, to men who claim to be brainy men, men of knowledge, men of wisdom, to the men who say there is no God, and to the men who laugh at the Bible, to the men who are free thinkers, agnostics, atheists, and to the men in religion who claim to be prophets. We have some people today who claim to be prophets. God Almighty is saying, let them bring them forth and show us what shall happen. Tell us what's going to happen if you're a prophet, and show us the end now. Before the beginning, that's what God has done. Listen, beloved, before I finish the series on prophetic truth, I'll show you in the Word of God, I'll show you that everything that has happened in the space program, the supersonic jet airplanes, the atomic bomb, the hydrogen bomb, the guided missiles, I'll show you that everything that is going on today that is so spectacular that it makes you dizzy to even read about it and think about what man has done. Just think about our expositions to the moon and, and think about the rockets that we have built and have uh, all over this country, that is, in case of war. Uh, beloved, it makes you dizzy. It absolutely makes you dizzy to think that in the next hour, in the next 60 minutes, man could. 98% of the human beings on the face of the earth, he could wipe them off the face of the earth, and man could be annihilated. At least 98% of the people could be wiped off the face of the earth in a matter of minutes. Now, that is a possibility. But you need not get nervous. Now, you just remember that God Almighty still controls the final affairs of men, and God has the final word. Now you say, Brother Green, suppose some careless man pushes the wrong button. You remember that God Almighty watches down upon careless men as well as he does men of wisdom. And you remember that man can't push the button unless God Almighty allows him to push the button. Now you say, Brother Green, do you believe that? Listen, beloved. I believe in the God of Daniel. And I read yesterday, and I'm not going to read it again today, in Daniel chapter 2... God gave to Daniel the course of the Gentiles from the beginning to the end. Centuries of history, God gave to Daniel, and Daniel revealed it to the king. And the king said, your God is the God of all gods. Now, in this series, of course, we're going to study the second coming. We're going to study the millennium. We're going to study the Antichrist, the beast, the false prophet. But long before we study the second coming, we're going to lay the foundation that God Almighty runs the affairs of men when the final word is to be said. Now, God allows, God permits, and then God orders now, we're going to study all this, and we're going to find it very interesting. But he is saying here in Isaiah, seven centuries before the birth of Christ, 27 centuries ago, God said to the smart alecks, and you'll just pardon me for using that word, I'm not sarcastic, but you know as well as I do that we have some men who are men of wisdom, they're giants in wisdom, and they're humble. And they, they know, I say this very reverently, they have forgotten more than I'll ever know about science, chemistry, astrology, and all of these things. I don't know anything about it. Now, I'm not, I'm not being sarcastic, and, and I, I thank God for the men of wisdom and knowledge and understanding and ability that we have in America. But I, I'm saying that we have some smart addicts, and you know it as well as I do. We have some smart addicts. Now, he's saying here to the smart addicts 
Produce your cause. Bring forth your strong reasons. You tell us what's going to happen before it happens. You prophesy as I've prophesied. For instance, in this series, I'm going to show you that is before Jesus was born, God Almighty through men, just like us, I'm talking about men in flesh and bones, just like we have flesh and bones. Men like Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they were just ordinary men. They lived in another age, of course. But God revealed to these men the exact time, the exact spot, and every minute detail God revealed to them centuries before it occurred, the birth of His Son, and what would happen to his son, and everything was as it was prophesied, and it happened in every minute detail. Jesus himself said, not one jot or tittle, and that's the smallest character in the Hebrew language, the smallest little character, not one jot, not one tittle of God Almighty's word will fail. And it has happened, and it's going to happen, just like God said. So in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 21 through 23, he said, You show us the things that have come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. Now you claim to be gods. You say there is no God. You say that God is just like us, or Christ was just another man. Now you say that. Now you produce proof. If you're going to make statements, you prove them. Now that's what God has done. And that's what I'm going to show you in this series. Now I want you to turn, if you will, to Second Peter. Second Peter. Now let me say this. I had a letter from a broken-hearted mother, and she sent me her son's letter from an army camp. Now again, I must explain. We have some of the dearest and some of the most spiritual Christians on the face of the earth in the United States Army, Navy, Marines, Coast Guards. We have servicemen that love God just as much as anybody loves God. And they're just as dedicated to God as you are, as I am, and some of them maybe more so. Now, we have some of the dearest Christians on earth in the armed forces, and we have some in there who claim to be agnostics, atheists, but listen, when they get out there and smell the hot blood of a dying buddy, I'll guarantee you it'll be another story. Now, don't you forget that. Don't you forget that. But this young man wrote a letter to his mother, and he said, Mother... He said, you know I'm a born-again Christian, but he said, I am being sorely tested, and I am being put to the test by the men in my company. Now, he said, continually, day by day, they're asking me to prove that there is a God, and they say there is no God. Now, he said, Mother, please help me. How can I prove to these people that there is a God? All right, now listen, let me tell you. There is only one way to prove that there is a God. And if I can't get this across to you, then you might as well cut the radio off and not listen to another word I say today, tomorrow, or any other day. Now, in Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, we read these words. We have, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now, in these verses that I've read, verses 19, 20, and 21 of Second Peter chapter 1, we have a more sure word of prophecy, and we do well to take heed. Now then, we know this, that no prophecy came, no prophecy came by the will of man. No prophecy is of private interpretation. That is, no man has any right to say, I believe this is what this means. I don't have any right to interpret the Word of God. The only right I have is to study and rightly divide the Word of God. 
and explain Scripture in the light of Scripture. Now, may I have your undivided attention, and I'll give you a simple, down-to-earth, understandable illustration. The only reason that I believe with all of my heart, and I do, I believe with all of my heart, that in 1492, Columbus discovered America. Now, I, you know, 1492, I didn't, I wasn't alive, and no one that I know was alive, and the only reason that I believe firmly that Columbus discovered America is because American history, and of course other history too, English history and other histories, uh, they, it, the, the books tell us, the history books tell us, that a man named Columbus discovered America. And I believe it. I believe it. I believe with all of my heart and all of my strength that George Washington was the first president of the United States of America. And the reason I believe that he was, I read it when I went to school. I read in the history books. And my teachers taught me that George Washington was the first president. Now let me tell you something, beloved. I know because of a book that there is a God. But there's another reason I know there's a God. I'm going to tell you why. Now, in the first place, I know there is a God because the Bible, and remember now, remember the Bible is God's infallible, unalterable, unalterable, God-breathed word. It cannot be altered. It cannot be changed. I don't care what man does to the Bible. He can't change it. It's God Almighty's infallible, unalterable word. God breathed. God breathed. God Almighty spoke, and I'm going to show you that God can speak and God can write. And God spoke, and holy men wrote down what God said, and God said to Moses, write, and Moses wrote, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God said to the psalmist, write, and he wrote, from everlasting to everlasting thou art God before the hills were formed, before the mountains were brought forth. From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Now that's Psalm 90, verses 1 and 2, Genesis 1 and verse 1. Now I know there's a God because the Bible tells me there is a God. The Bible tells me there's a God. Now I'm going to tell you another reason that I know there's a God. You know why? 36 years ago, one night, I stood in the doorway of a little country church. And I heard a humble minister preach on the wages of sin is death. And then he told me that God loved me. And I stood in the doorway and listened. The church was packed and I couldn't get a seat. I stood in the doorway of the church and the minister said, God loves sinners and it's not God's will that any perish but that all repent. And I heard what that minister said, and I believed what that minister said. And after everyone else had gone from the church, I went back inside, and I went to that minister. And he took a little black testament out of his coat pocket, and he read, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And he explained to me that God wanted me to put my trust in Jesus and in the shed blood of Jesus, and in the finished work of Jesus. And to the best of my knowledge, and I had no understanding of the Word of God, I was not a Sunday school boy. I was far from it. The only time I ever went inside of a church was when one of my relatives died, and I was forced to go to church to take my family to a funeral. And that's the only time I ever went inside of a church. Now, the minister said, God loves you, and Jesus died for you. Do you believe this? And I said, yes. And he read some other scriptures to me. And I went home that night. And I bowed down by the window in my little bedroom in a little country farmhouse. And I said, oh, God, I don't know how to pray and I don't know what to say. But I said, God, you know what I need. You know what I want. I want to be saved. I want to be delivered from sin. I don't want to go to hell. And God knew my heart. And knowing my heart, God saved me. Now, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You may, you may... Uh, caused me to believe that there was no Columbus. And you might convince me that Columbus did not discover America. And it might be possible for you to convince me that George Washington was not the first president of the United States. But I'm going to tell you something that you can't convince me 
that there is no God because God Almighty transformed my life. When God saved me, I was a lying, stealing, cussing drunk. And I was in the gutter and God saved me and picked me up out of the gutter. And it happened, it happened, I didn't go anywhere. I didn't go to a rest home. I didn't go to a, a clinic. I didn't go somewhere and they fed me a certain diet and gave me certain drugs and got the alcohol out of my veins. No, no, it happened in a split second when I said, yes, preacher, yes, preacher, I believe with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength that God Almighty loved me, that Jesus died for me. Now let me tell you something. I know there's a God because the Bible tells me there is a God. And I know there's a God because God made a new man out of me 36 years ago. I know there is a God. And when a man asks you to prove that there is a God, if he refuses to believe the Bible, if he refuses to hear the Bible, you can't prove to him there is a God. There is no way to prove to any man there is a God if he refuses to accept the Word of God. In the beginning, God. In the beginning, God created. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And of course, 2,000 years ago, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was God in flesh. And we'll talk about that tomorrow, and I'll give you some more interesting scriptures. Father... Honor thy precious word, the precious name of Jesus, the precious blood, and save souls that are under conviction. Save every soul that's calling upon your name. Save the soul that's nearest hell. For Jesus' sake, amen. The message you have just heard is available on an audio cassette. To receive your personal copy, write us a letter. Be sure to give today's date. Enclose a gift of at least $3 to cover the cost of production and handling. The address, The Gospel Hour, Box...